This is Kenya, a country known for its beautiful landscapes, safaris, and perhaps some of the best tea in the world. Though its economy is so much more than just tourism and giraffes, acting as a hub for transport and finance across East Africa. As the fourth largest economy in Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya has the sort of market presence you'd associate with a regional power, particularly when it comes to logistics and trade, which we'll be delving into later. In a region not well known for its economic stability, the nation has managed to achieve sustained economic growth, averaging a more than 5% rate during the 2010s. To put that in context, this was the highest rate since the 70s, when its economy was much, much smaller. For a country where manufacturing accounts for less than 10% of GDP, a share which has actually been on the decline in recent years, this is a remarkable achievement, which makes the nation's success all the more intriguing. One that the government is keen to link to Vision 2030, an ambitious development blueprint that aims to create a globally competitive country by, you guessed it, 2030. On paper, its growth helped it achieve the World Bank's lower middle income status in 2014. Though Kenya doesn't plan on stopping there, its aim is to become an upper middle income country by 2030. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Extreme inequality and corruption are huge issues. Staggering levels we'll be highlighting later on in the video. For now though, Kenya's economy raises some important questions. How did Kenya become East Africa's economic powerhouse? What makes Kenya an effective partner for its landlocked neighbours? How successful could Vision 2030 be? And what are its challenges and solutions? But first, we have some exciting news. We've recently launched a new website, altsimplified.tv, to provide you with even more content. This includes content on our most popular videos, exclusive blog articles, detailed references, including the ones for this video, and new infographic maps. The link to altsimplified.tv is in the description below. So, how did Kenya become East Africa's economic powerhouse? This begins not just with Kenya, but the wider East African region. For centuries, the area's coastline has been a focus of global trade. One prized for the trade winds which would transport vessels from ports like Mombasa and Zanzibar all the way to India, attracting Arab, Portuguese and then British traders. Though it would arguably be the latter who had the greatest impact on the Kenya we know today. In the late 19th century, European powers were in a hurry to grab basically anything in Africa they deemed as unclaimed territories despite the fact that these territories were very much being claimed by the people who already lived there. Hmm. Britain and Germany in particular took a keen interest in the region, eyeing up both the Sultanate of Zanzibar, which followed the coastline, and the East African interior. To save their fighting for the 20th century, Britain and Germany decided to split the region, Germany taking the lands roughly equivalent to Tanzania, and Britain, modern-day Kenya and Uganda. However, Britain didn't really want full responsibility for the region, so he decided to allow a company to administer and develop the territory, one creatively called the Imperial British East Africa Company in 1888. One of the company's main aims was to build a railway from the coast all the way to the fertile lands of Lake Victoria, and in the process, starting Kenya's journey to become the gateway to East Africa. But, after quickly running out of funds and having no real experience, the lands were transferred to the British government. Here, Kenya was split from Uganda to become the East African Protectorate in 1895, and then the Colony and Protectorate of Kenya in 1920, the colony referring to the interior, whilst the Protectorate, a 10-mile coastal strip under the Sultan of Zanzibar. For Britain, Kenya provided fertile agriculture, cheap labour, and a central location for other African colonies complete with natural ports and one of the only railway systems in the region. But the colony was largely kept underdeveloped, focusing on agricultural exports. After a prolonged and brutal struggle for independence, Kenya emerged as an independent nation in 1963, finally being able to follow its own economic path. Something the nation really took to heart, becoming a laboratory for economic development, where the government proclaimed it would follow a Kenyan version of African socialism, which focused on three core aims. Mutual social responsibility, adaptability to changing circumstances, and avoiding dependency on others for its development. Something which sounded great in theory, though in reality, growth was prioritised above virtually everything else. A key part of this growth strategy was based on providing local companies effective monopolies, 
which the government achieved through protective trade policies like high tariffs on imports and quotas. And for the first couple of decades, the system worked fairly well, at least when it came to overall growth, as Kenya grew at an average rate of 7% per year. In fairness though, this high growth rate was from a low base, but nonetheless a growth rate many countries envied. However, an economic strategy centred around high tariffs for imports and policies of import substitution couldn't last forever. At some point, the small domestic market would become saturated with local goods, and then the policies would basically run out of steam. On top of this, by the late 70s, Kenya's relatively closed trading outlook became even more closed. A regional cooperation agreement with neighbouring Uganda and Tanzania, called the East Africa Community, collapsed in 1977, but don't worry, its successor plays a big role later on in the video. Now, despite adopting increasingly inward-looking policies, Kenya managed to avoid economic reform until the 80s. How it managed this is partly due to an unlikely source though, a massive increase in the commodity price of coffee. Yes, you heard that right, coffee as well as an increase in the price of another main export, tea. During the 70s, the rising export prices for tea and coffee increased flows of foreign currency into the country, allowing the government to hold back on any serious reforms. Why go through painful reforms when the country's businesses could continue to pay for imports with the foreign currency it was earning from sky-high caffeine prices? Yet, nothing lasts forever. When the price of coffee fell, so did the country's flow of foreign money. And as soon as that dried up, so did its international purchasing power, exposing the very deep problems with the nation's inward-looking business model. Struggling to pay its debts, Kenya turned to the World Bank for a loan. In return, the nation promised to open up its closed economy and make it more competitive. But there is a big difference between being forced to do something and actually wanting to do something. And Kenya provides some great examples of this distinction such as when the government agreed to allow more imports into the country, which sounded simple enough if it wasn't for the fact that it raised tariffs on the price of these goods, not quite living up to the spirit of the agreement then. Actions like this were symbolic of Kenya's slow progress to open up, though over time it did, but tariffs and quotas were only part of the story. Another factor was the exchange rate controls. Until the 90s, Kenya operated a pegged exchange rate, fixing the number of Kenyan shillings to a basket of currencies, making business practices a nightmare. Due to a shortage of foreign reserves, businesses had to apply for a foreign exchange allocation if they wanted to import, meaning if you didn't receive an allocation, you couldn't pay for your imports, at least not through official channels. This crazy situation ended with Kenya opening up its exchange rate. In 1993, the Kenyan shilling was allowed to float freely, a year which also saw Kenya reforge the East African Community, or EAC, with Tanzania and Uganda. This community has since become a wider movement across East Africa, focusing on a customs union with ambitions to implement a single currency. Comparisons to the EU aside, we'll be discussing the EAC more in the next section. Since the 90s, Kenya has continued on its long march to become a more open, competitive economy. As part of this trade liberalisation, Kenya's banking system has become one of the most developed on the continent, ranking second in sub-Saharan Africa for access to a bank account, ahead of South Africa, and only behind Mauritius. Fun fact. This increased financial access has a wealth of benefits, not just making it easier to save, but also invest or just effectively participate in the economy especially when a staggering 83% of workers operate in the informal sector. Now, despite its large informal sector, Kenya's strong financial industry helps underpin its role as a relatively stable country, often acting as a middleman in trade and investment for some of its more volatile neighbours. In fairness, that doesn't mean it's been immune to turmoil though. The most infamous example is the disputed 2007 election, which led to widespread rioting and civil unrest. Economically, this had ramifications beyond just Kenya. Analysts estimate regional growth was reduced by 1.5% due to civil unrest. The country's hardest hit were those around the Great Lakes, and this has a lot to do with trade routes. More than 80% of Uganda's imports pass through the Kenyan port of Mombasa, as do almost all of Rwanda's exports. Which leads us nicely onto the next question. What makes Kenya an effective partner for its landlocked neighbours? 
Unsurprisingly, Kenya's position on the map makes it an obvious trading route for countries like Uganda, Rwanda or South Sudan. The country's largest port, Mombasa, doesn't just serve the 53 million people in Kenya, but over 200 million people in the wider region. Though being an effective partner goes beyond just geography. Kenya's infrastructure legacy has meant trade, businesses and even whole towns have been built up over time, in a sort of positive feedback cycle. More connections lead to more trade, which leads to more people, which leads to more connections, and so it goes on. Yet, this regional trade doesn't exist in isolation. There's the East African Community, or EAC, that we mentioned earlier. While efforts at regional trade blocks tend to have mixed results, the East African Community has been quite successful. The EAC, in and of itself, is now a significant regional market and vehicle for development and stability. One Kenya plays a massive role in accounting for over 40% of EAC trade with the world and 38% of trade between members. While Kenya has its own vision, the EAC is targeting aggressive growth under its own vision, Vision 2050, which has set the ambitious goal of increasing the region's GDP per capita tenfold by 2050. Why tenfold? Well, this would place the region in upper middle income status. As a trade bloc, the intention is to achieve this through increasing trade. And so far, studies indicate early success on the back of dramatic increases in trade within the bloc. Trade amongst members has already increased by 120% compared to non-trade bloc members, with Kenya playing a key role in facilitating this growing trade. Ranking 68th place on the World Bank's Logistics Performance Index, a better than average performance compared to Sub-Saharan Africa. To help strengthen these logistics, the port of Lamu to the north of Mombasa has recently been funded and built by China part of a much wider $23 billion project called the Lamu Port South Sudan Ethiopia Transport, or LAPSET. As we saw in our Pakistan video, China has been investing heavily in countries across the world through the Belt and Road Initiative, with investments like LAPSET a prime opportunity for Chinese commerce. Not to be left out, the port of Mombasa has also been undergoing a major expansion and renovation. The Mombasa-Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway, known as the SGR, is the nation's most expensive infrastructure project. At $5.6 million per kilometre of track, the SGR is three times more expensive than the international standard and four times the original estimate. But why was it so expensive? Well, difficult terrain has made building costly bridges and tunnels a necessity, as well as making the track capable of handling higher than average cargo loads points which make it less comparable to other projects. Putting the cost aside, the SGR is still considered crucial to Kenya's logistical future. Before it was built, roughly 95% of cargo was transported by road and only 5% by rail. Kenya Railways is aiming to increase transport by track to 40% by 2025. For that to happen, getting projects like the SGR right is key. Now, improvements to infrastructure are just one in a series of ambitious targets Kenya wants to achieve. Targets mostly set out in its Vision 2030, the nation's overarching economic plan we alluded to earlier. First announced in 2007, the plan is split into four pillars. Economic, social, political and enablers. Each pillar has its own set of targets, with the agenda being broken down into five-year timeframes referred to as medium-term plans. Plans which sound great, though it's only fair to ask, how successful could Vision 2030's economic goals be? To address this, we're going to look at two core goals. First, increasing the growth rate to about 10% of GDP. And second, raising the contribution of manufacturing from about 9-15% to of GDP. Starting with its 10% growth, this is an insanely high rate to aim for. To understand just how ambitious this is, over the previous 25 years, Kenya's annual GDP growth was a mere 3%, having crept up to 5% over the last decade. Interestingly, its neighbour Ethiopia was the world's fastest growing economy over the 2010s, recording a whopping 149% growth in GDP, though one which started from a much lower base if you looked at output per person and is still a fair way behind Kenya. By starting at a much higher base level, could make it a lot harder for Kenya to achieve such a high rate of growth. To try to achieve this crazy rate, the country has outlined targets and plans for different sectors of the economy, with a strong emphasis on improving agricultural productivity, which employs over half the labour force. Yet, to be fair, farming isn't the only part of the strategy. 
Another big opportunity is outsourcing, especially for services like telecoms or business admin. Pursuing business outsourcing isn't something unique to Kenya. Many developing countries, from India to the Philippines, are using it as a way to raise their service sector contributions to GDP. Moving away from the service sector, one of Kenya's main aims is to raise its manufacturing from about 9-15% to of GDP. The sector is deemed crucial to help it reach upper middle income status. Unlike agriculture or low-end services, manufacturing is often seen as a more productive form of employment. Unfortunately for Kenya though, instead of increasing its share, manufacturing has been on the slide, accounting for less than 8% of GDP, a result of failing to attract enough firms or investment into the sector. Though that doesn't mean it hasn't made progress in laying the right foundations. In order to flourish, a manufacturing sector requires a lot of energy something the country has been working on, making massive gains when it comes to both access to energy and overall supply capacity. Just 20 years ago, less than 20% of the population had access to electricity, a figure which now stands at over 75%, a gain only made possible through large-scale private investment and significant government intervention in projects like hydropower and geothermal energy. These renewable energy sectors are actually hugely important sectors to the nation's energy grid, accounting for over two-thirds of all electricity generated. As a bonus fact, Kenya is actually the world's eighth largest producer of geothermal energy, all down to its very active Rift Valley region, a region currently tearing the continent apart. Though fear not, the Kenyan authorities have an estimated 5 to 10 million years before the continent splits and a new ocean forms. No pressure. Now, putting geography lessons aside, what are Kenya's main challenges and solutions? A good place to start is with what the government identified as its main challenges back in 2017. Helpfully, the government has labelled these the Big Four. These include increasing manufacturing, improving food security, creating better housing, and improved access to healthcare. We already spoke about manufacturing, but what about the others? When you look at Kenya's food security, it's well known for savanna grassland, but actually has a really low proportion of land fit for agriculture. Something highlighted when you compare it to its neighbours. The trouble is that over 70% of the population live outside of cities, most in small-scale farming without irrigation. This makes them extremely vulnerable to natural events like too little or even too much rain. Before mentioning the plague of locusts which ripped through the region in 2020, to address this challenge, a lot of effort is going into raising farming productivity. But with such a large proportion of the population still in agriculture, the longer term plan is to use rising productivity to move more people away from small-scale farming towards other sectors. These new sector opportunities will revolve around the manufacturing and services we mentioned earlier. Opportunities more than likely to be found in urban areas. Leading on to the next challenge, housing or more specifically, providing good quality, affordable housing. Nairobi is already home to Africa's largest slum, Kibera. Faced with a rising population, growing urban areas and a very large informal sector, housing can't be ignored. To solve this, the government pledged to build around 500,000 affordable homes. But so far, there's been little sign of progress. And without adequate housing, which is planned and connected to local services, it's unlikely the government will be able to meet their final goal of providing universal healthcare coverage. Now, Kenya's challenges stretch well beyond the big four. However, a lot of them can be pinned back to the extreme levels of inequality in the country. According to the international charity Oxfam, less than 0.1% of the population, or 8,300 people to be precise, own more wealth than the bottom 99.9%. In fairness, whilst the wealth divide between the 0.1% and the rest isn't exclusive to Kenya, extreme poverty is something it will have to address, notably through anti-corruption, if it truly wants to become a middle-income country by 2030. Okay, so this has actually been our longest ever video to date. One which we could have dragged on for a lot longer, as there were a lot of points we didn't have time to fully address, like Kenya's natural resources. Compared to so many other African nations, Kenya doesn't have a large mining industry, playing more of a logistical role as a transport hub for those that do, whilst avoiding the resource curse which has afflicted countries like the DRC. However, that's not to say that new mining isn't set to play a role in the future. 
New laws and new mines are forecasted to raise the sector's influence in the economy, something likely to give a new meaning to the Belt and Road style projects which Kenya has so actively embraced. What we found most striking is the progress the country has made without a flagship industry, something you can see by its really high share of agriculture and reliance on tourism to generate foreign earnings, hoping to drive home the point that if it wants to reach middle income status, it will need to raise manufacturing's contribution to its overall economic output. This isn't however to undermine the progress Kenya has made since the 90s. For example, the nation managed to raise its Human Development Index from 0.48 to 0.6, despite periods of civil unrest, a predominantly rural population, and high rates of extreme poverty. With this background context, a lot of Vision 2030's targets seem to be overly ambitious. But without ambition, what chance does the nation stand of making the rapid progress it wants to achieve? And finally, it's over to you. We'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Is Vision 2030 overly ambitious? Will Kenya run the risk of falling into a debt trap? How do you think Kenya can raise its manufacturing share? We're keen to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, consider leaving us a like and subscribing. And as always, see you in the next video.